it certainly was the best that it could be done at the time. It was the largest film project I think we ever did. It was the first year of our company, Stetson Visual Services, in 1989, and one of our inaugural projects. Um, we had a shop that was about 45 miles away from DreamQuest Images in Simi Valley, where all the work was shot, uh, and uh, built all the miniatures, which are very large miniature landscapes, uh, in our shop in, in Westchester, and then trucked them up to uh, DreamQuest uh, for final assembly up there for the photography. It was a very large endeavor. It's the largest film project I think we ever did. We thought that um, it seemed odd that DreamQuest would look to us, because they had a model shop of their own, uh, would look to us to do the work on the film. But when we realized the scope of the work, we realized that there wasn't enough room at DreamQuest at that time to really build and prep the miniatures and then get them in there. We ended up renting a, a warehouse next to our shop. So we had about 20,000 square feet of miniature construction space uh, for the movie. And to do that off-site, even though we had to truck the stuff all 45 miles away, uh, it really let us pre-sculpt and pre-build everything and then uh, install it on their stages very quickly. Um, all the final dressing was done on stage uh, so that um, all the details of the, of the red soil and the tiny little trains and everything else, that was all you know, put in place uh, up in Simi Valley. So it was several days of installation time for each of the miniature landscapes. We did not only the Martian landscapes, but also uh, the little vehicles, the spaceship that brings them to Mars, and the little train that he rides across, and, and then also the uh, reactor interior, the atmospheric reactor interior on the planet uh, uh, in several scales uh, for uh, the work that was done in there, including the explosive uh, firing up of the, of the reactor at the end. Those were days when you really needed a lot of scale to. Uh, a lot of size to make the miniature events uh, uh, like steam and smoke and fire uh, believable. And so that thing was a pretty elaborate, uh, large mountain structure. But there were some nice little tricks that we used to sort of expand the scope and scale of the miniatures. Um, I had tried um, uh, a, a gag on uh, 2010 earlier in my career where um, we had a sort of a, a multi-planed miniature setup. Uh, uh, where we had a painted backing traveling with the camera as it dollied across the front of the miniature so that it made the backing appear to be at infinity where the, um, where the miniature was, uh, uh, or as the camera was traveling by the miniature in the foreground. Now we did the same trick on uh, Total Recall in the train ride from the spaceport into the city when Arnold's riding on the train. We came up with this little, uh, this great little uh, rear projection uh, device uh, for the abyss that we modeled into the into the train, so. so that the scene of Arnold at the train's window looking out, and the camera pulls out very wide uh, to uh, reveal the whole landscape. That was done actually as a rear projection gag. So, uh, the uh, shot of um, Arnold that Eric, that Eric Brevik had shot in Mexico. Uh, was then rear projected into this tiny little screen, probably only about this big, uh, inside, the, uh, inside the train car. And the camera pulled out wide, and you see the entire landscape. It was kind of cool. We used a lot of front projection on the, on the rods. We had two scales of the, of the reactor rods. The small ones we wrapped with front projection material, and the cinematographer, Alex Funky, um, used a beam splitter device to, um, to il illuminate the rods as they appeared to glow. Uh, the, uh, uh, then the larger scale ones we built as, as acrylic uh, tubes and lit them from within so that they, as the camera got closer in, you'd see you needed to have that internal light to make them look more real. And Bob and his special effects team uh, came up with some fairly large steam generator plants uh, uh, so that as the rods are inserted into the ice, 
base of the, of the cavern, all this steam comes rising up in these huge clouds of steam. And it was pretty impressive uh, to watch. Uh, usually, you know, miniature scale things don't look like much until you see them played back from their high-speed photography. Uh, but uh, in this case, they were pretty big gags all by themselves. For, for miniature effects work, it was pretty great. Eric Brevig came up with a really nice gag, I thought, um, for one of the pullout shots at the end of the movie as after the mountain has exploded and uh, the atmosphere is formed. Uh, there was a scene where all the uh, mutant residents of the, of the city step outside into the, into the air and the camera pulls very wide and we see a final wide tableau of the, of the landscape. And, and Eric did that with a front projection gag on a little curved screen. It was probably only about that big, built about that big, built into one of the, into one of the miniature areas. And the camera pulled back from there, and it was really a seamless uh, integration of the of the element that was shot for that. I thought Alex Funky did a really nice gag for moving clouds for those wide scenes too. At the end of the movie, after the atmosphere was formed, the idea was to show sort of earth lighting at that time. So um, he had. Uh, little cloud shapes strung on wires across the top of the set. And, and again, these were warehouse buildings and not huge stages. So he had a griffle on the top of, you know, the ceiling of the set, as high as he could make it, and bounced the light up into them, and then had these little uh, shadow grids on wires moving, pulled by motion control across the set, and made cast shadows practically on the landscape. I did a great job at that, it's really beautiful. so relentlessly red. We were very worried about it in the days of VHS and red bleed and bloom and all the, you know, all the, you know, and all the transfers afterwards. Paul said quite emphatically that he didn't care about the video aftermarket. All he wanted was his film to be red on camera in the theaters, you know, and, and uh, that Mars, of course, we were working entirely on Mars. And to have this big transition into this red environment was really, really kind of nice. We ended up with a lot of red stucco dyes dusting over very gently over our landscape, so the finished work on it was all in this red powder because of the fine scale we were working in. Everybody got very dirty. Generally, as soon as Alex Funky was done shooting him, we'd take him outside and break them up. And at the end of it, when all the last sets were broken up, we had a bit of a party. And uh, there was a forklift involved that we'd haul the things out, raise them up as high as the forklift would go, and <laughs> smash them on the ground, clouds of red dust. When we first started talking about the concept of what would you see for an x-ray, I mean, we didn't really have these devices yet for the airport. And uh, everybody remembers the one where you stick your foot in your shoe and you could x-ray your foot to see how well the fit was when we were kids back in the 50s and 60s. But uh, people had been looking at medical imaging and had seen amazing uh, images of skin and muscle and bone and, you know, we had ideas of trying to take it that far, but when it was really beyond the technology of what we could have pulled off at the time, that didn't keep us from thinking we might want to try it still. But Paul then ultimately fell in love with just the clean graphic image of what a human skeleton by itself looks like. Uh, and then the ability to make it that color that uh, everybody thinks electronic instruments should look like when they're photographed with film, which is a sort of cyan green color. Uh, so the challenge for us was to get convincing human motion uh, so that we believe that's really the same person walking behind the screen rather than that it's a, an effect. And uh, we needed to come up with a way of rendering something that looked like uh, an x-ray. And x-rays uh, always show the edge of the bone, but the center of the bone is transparent. But yet, to have a real detailed, interesting image, you need to also see some of the spirally uh, variations that bones have. And so we came up with uh, uh, two techniques that we applied to the rendering to make it look like an x-ray. One was to use what was a, a trick, which was called center and edge opacity. You could make the edge more transparent or more opaque, and then the center the opposite. In the case of 
We used to do that as a trick to make glass look like crystal. And so we use that technique to make the edges of the bone more visible and the center more transparent. And then we used opacity mapping, which we had to write some special software to make that happen. When we first set up the motion capture equipment, Arnold was shooting some other scenes nearby and he walked over and he was smoking a cigar and he walked up and back on the motion capture stage and since he was on the stage, we figured, well, let's see how high we need to set the calibration for his height because he's a pretty tall guy and you gotta put a ball on top of his head. So we said, Arnold, is it all right if we put this ball on top of your head, we need to calibrate? And so he looked at us straight in the eye, was puffing his cigar, because they play a lot of jokes on set. He thought this might have been one of them. So he's looking us in the eyes. We put the ball on his head, and he stands up. He said, yeah, now, if you could walk back and forth. And you know, he did. And then we said, OK, thank you very much. And you know, give us back the ball. And he realized it wasn't a joke, but it seemed like a very strange thing at that time to be doing. On the day of the motion capture, Arnold, uh, we had asked the wardrobe people to dress Arnold in black, and he was going to wear all these sensors that were going to show up light. And uh, we thought that would be the best solution. But the video cameras were really black and white video cameras. And uh, Arnold showed up that day with white. And uh, we said, oh, Arnold, there's a mistake. You're supposed to be wearing black. And Arnold said to us, no, 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 no. You don't talk to me. You talk to wardrobe. I'm wearing this now, we shoot with this. He wore 18 balls, I believe, that were reflective balls. There were lights at six different video cameras around capturing his motion. And then the, the computer went and figured out that that dot that's seen from this camera is the same dot as seen from this camera and these other five cameras so that can then figure out where that ball is in space. And so we shot everything that we needed to do in that day. We captured everything. I was being told throughout the capture or the motion capture from the motion capture guy who, whose system this was. He's, oh yeah, this is the best motion capture we've ever captured. It's, it's gonna be great. It's gonna just, we're gonna put it in the computer and it's gonna just spit out perfect motion and we're all very encouraged and we're all very happy about this. And we, we complete the shooting and the capture. And then weeks later, we find out that it's not working at all. They can't get anything from it. In fact, one of the, the bad pieces of news from the motion capture company was they said, well, maybe we could get a cycle from his motion from it and give you that. And it's like, that would only work if he's doing something very regular, like just walking at a regular pace and that was it. But Arnold comes in and he does a whole lot of other stuff and then he breaks through the glass at one point. So, you know, a cycle was not gonna help us at all. So we realized we were going to have to rotoscope from footage that was not really prepared for that kind of work. So it turned out that it was a completely wonderful thing that Arnold was wearing white because then we could make out his whole form, all of his limbs, and be able to rotoscope and, and match the motion of the computer skeleton to his real motion. Had he worn black like we had requested, it would have been much harder, if not impossible. So thank God Arnold's wardrobe person didn't do our request and that he wouldn't change. Luckily for us, uh, we shot a backplate camera that showed us the opposite side of the screen because when the actor walks into the screen, it isn't really an x-ray device, so we don't really see what's going on behind it. We just see them walk in, then they come out the other end, and we don't know what happened in between. So with this back camera, we were able to see all of the characters, how their walks might have changed in relation to each other. And in fact, the introductory shot has like eight people, uh, including Arnold, and one of the persons is supposed to be blind, and he has a seeing eye dog. And that dog, as he's walking through the take that Paul liked the best, the dog decided that it would be a nice time to relieve himself. And uh, first, uh, Paul thought it would be funny if the dog actually does that in the x-ray, because the, again, from the front, we could make the dog do anything we want, because we couldn't see what he was really doing. 
But then Paul thought that perhaps that would be too distracting and people would go away remembering that instead of remembering that this is how the X-ray is supposed to work in a normal situation because the next time we see it in the film, it's when Arnold has a gun, which it's designed to detect. So he decided to have us make the dog continue to walk normally instead of stop and try to relieve himself. You are now entering a safety zone. No unauthorized weapons allowed beyond this point. You are now entering a safety zone. No unauthorized weapons allowed beyond this point. He was known for having a temper. When we came down to uh, Mexico, we had already heard stories about people who had bad run-ins with him on set, and uh, we were nervous. And uh, but Paul was always really great with us. We uh, we had very easy time working with him. And uh, I remember one time uh, we were in the edit room putting together the sequence and refining the animation. And I remember I was sort of pushing a point. That I, that I really wanted to see in, in that particular shot. And Paul just stopped and looked at me and I realized, oh my God, <laughs> shut up. He does, I've already said this thing one or two or three times already. He already said no. And he's just looking at me wondering, how many more times am I gonna do that? And I just realized, oh, sorry, Paul. He never yelled, he never got upset. It, it was just very easy to work with him. Uh, sometimes he would be caught trying to say something that was uh, that he was trying to express some idea that he was trying to verbalize and there would be times when he would sort of get stuck uh, i remember he explained to us very well how he wanted the color red for the, the when the device goes off and detects uh, the guns and you know we said it could be any color you like and he said red but he said red this very very long-winded uh, multiple repetitious thing that it, you could just tell that he was really thinking about it. it was really he was sort of having a uh, an argument with himself almost in front of us and then the answer was red <laughs> and that was it Hold it. He's over Don't there. Move. we had the only CG in the film and at that time what we did was really hard and you know computers were pushed to the limit to do that kind of work at that time and there was far more uh, handwork required to make it work since the motion capture uh, technique didn't work directly. So actually there was a lot of hand, uh, hand keyframed uh, finessed pieces to it and uh, the, the actual the rendering of it and the compositing of it wasn't really that hard for that time but getting that kind of animation at that time with the tools as they were was very difficult. So we were just happy as heck when we developed when we finally delivered uh, the animation uh, and we were one of the first effects uh, to be delivered as a final and for us it was longer than it should have been and much more scary you know that it was going to turn out all right and uh, when we finally got the final elements delivered uh, for the I don't know, 15 16 shots that we had in the film you know, all this stuff was combined optically back then, so uh, a, a, a negative uh, is, is struck from the original negative, an inner positive and an inner negative, and then our stuff is an original negative, and then there are all these levels of mats and things like that to be able to let the level of opacity and transparency that needed to be there for the, the X-ray effect on the screen. And so all these things are fine-tuned, but there's lots of layers of celluloid and they pick up dust you know the more times you use the optical elements again they start to get dirty or scratched or eventually you get to a point where you need to remake the elements again if you've run the optical too many times and because the the visual effects budget of the movie was challenged already uh, when we finally had the animation working perfectly they didn't want to clean the elements and so my visual effects producer George Merkert and myself were thinking well you know this is the biggest thing in our life so far in, in visual effects that we've ever done and they don't want to spend the extra money so maybe 
if we cough up six thousand dollars, you know, between the two of us, if, if maybe if we tell the visual effects producer that we're willing to do that, so that we rerun the Africa with new elements, you know, maybe that'll work. And by telling her that, she she was moved that we would even suggest that. But you know, we felt like you know we're going to look terrible if this thing isn't perfect. You know, you know, we we wanted to be the best, and so uh, it. It sort of moved her, and she made sure that they were paid for another optical run to create the elements again. And it looked perfect the next time we saw it, and we were thrilled. I remembered that uh, when the original film came out, uh, because we were relatively new at doing visual effects and, and feature films, we didn't really know how to negotiate properly for screen credits. So uh, we were negotiated into a position of having what's called a company credit only. So instead of saying George Murphy, Tim McGovern, and the rest of the crew, it just said Metro Light Studios, which was the company that we worked for at the time. And uh, we had hoped that that was going to change somehow, but we went to the, the cast and crew screening, and we waited through the whole movie, and I saw our effect cut into the, the whole. That's the first time we saw it. Uh, cut in context of the entire film. We'd seen pieces, you know, the pieces we had done, but not the rest. And, you know, the rest of the work in the movie is fantastic, you know, especially, again, you have to put everything in the context of 1990 when it came out, but it's, uh, you know, so much of it is still great by today's standards. But uh, when we saw the credit at the end and it just said Metro Light Studios, our, our hearts were broken. We were like, oh, God, we don't even get our name on it, for God's sakes. So uh, when the film went on to win the Academy Award for visual effects, and uh, when the producer and director had decided well, you know, you know, who the four people were going to be named, they thought the visual effects that were done with the uh, computer-generated part had added a dimension to the film that they thought was important enough to mention. Uh, that sort of shamed the people who didn't give us a screen credit. So the video tape, which in those days, this was a VHS videotape release. Uh, when the VHS tape came out, we had a credit, the names of everybody who worked on the film. So we were very thrilled about that. So uh, years later, when I worked at Sony, uh, I ran Sony Pictures Image Works. It took it from eight people up to 250 people. And uh, there was a moment when they said, we got a brand new print from Total Recall. Let's all go take a look at it you know, and bring the whole company. And so everybody's sitting there and seeing the whole movie and seeing our sequence and you know, clapping when they see the sequence that they knew that I worked on. And then when the credits come up, my name's not in there because it's the theatrical release, which didn't have the credits uh, uh, changed. So everybody's sitting there talking to me afterwards, going, hey, you know, your name wasn't in the credits. What happened? It's like, oh, yeah. I forgot about that, yeah. You know, it's in the video, but not in the film.